Hi, this is Robert Wright. One thing I like about the conversations I have here on The Wright Show is that they help me think and write. They've informed the books and many of the articles I've written over the past 15 years. Now, lately, most of my writing has been for my newsletter, the Non-Zero Newsletter. It covers the kinds of topics you see on the show. Politics, foreign policy, psychology, philosophy, spirituality, how to avoid the apocalypse, things like that. So if you enjoy The Right Show, chances are pretty good that you'll enjoy the newsletter. It's free, and all you have to do to get it is go to nonzero.org and sign up. So I suggest that you hit pause, go sign up, and then hit play. Thanks. Hi, Kaiser. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm doing okay. How are you? Uh, you know, in Trump-adjusted terms, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> just fine. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Divided by uh, 10 or something? Yeah, I think it's a, the, the factor continues to go up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, but the time, uh, the term itself may, may be, may be nearing its end. Um, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Kaiser Quo, as I would pronounce your last name. You might say it more like... Gua, but uh, I don't. I mean, I I do on the show. It's it's a thing. It's my siblings all pronounce it quo. I'm the only holdout who. You know, oh, I see. The, yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with being on a different wavelength from from my Trump supporting siblings. But <laughs> oh. I but I but I digress. Um, uh, the show you referred to is your podcast Seneca, which you've been doing for ten years now. That's right. And it is about China. Uh, various aspects of China, uh, political, geopolitical, cultural, historical, social. Um, and that is one of the things that qualifies you to talk about what we're going to talk about today, which is China, uh, which, of course, has been very much in the news lately, as have Chinese-U.S. relations, uh, which may be uh, taking a turn for the South. Uh, by common reckoning, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, a lot of aspects of that. Uh, I should say that you're having done this podcast is uh, far from the only thing that qualifies you to talk about the subject. Um, your your heritage does, but also you've kind of been back and forth between the U.S. and China. And one thing in particular, and I'm gonna have to start here, okay? Uh, because this is really something on your biography that is that really stands out. You, in 1989, started, uh, you co-founded a rock and roll group in China that became, I guess, the first big heavy metal band in China, maybe, maybe still the biggest ever, I don't know, very big group. Now, you, you, you actually left shortly thereafter, but then you came back, so you were with the, with, with the group at the beginning, you were with the group in the late 90s. That's right. Um, and in fact, uh, those those who are watching this uh, on video, not just listening to the podcast, may notice that you have uh, some musical stuff in the background. You're, you were the yeah. you were the lead guitarist, or what? I was, yeah. So I have to start out with the question: like, what is it like to be a rock star in China, <laughs> and what is the difference between what would you imagine the difference is between that and being a rock star in America, if any? Well, it changed a lot over the years, obviously. Um, when I started off um, playing in, in the late 80s and even when I'd go back in the early 90s, uh, it was just still really bewildering to most of our audiences. There was just no context for it. They had never heard any music like it before. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was that. I mean, there was just the audiences were were so completely just dumbstruck by what they were seeing. I mean, it was just an assault. And most of them had their hands clapped to their ears, and they just couldn't couldn't stand it at all. But you know, we slowly. Now, now was that because it was heavy metal, or had they been insulated from kind of American popular music, or at least American rock more broadly? I'd say by the time that I started playing, I mean, there there was a, a tiny little uh, minority of people, and only in the more cosmopolitan cities like Beijing and, and maybe Shanghai, who had been exposed at all to any you know genuine Western uh, music. But uh, there was no no sense of what the different genres were. I mean, to to them, Michael Jackson or Madonna were not, you know, in a different genre of music, say, from the Carpenters or from uh, Van Halen. Uh, uh -huh. It was all sort of, in, you know, this indistinct mass of Western popular music. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, it changed extremely quickly. I mean, by the time, by the late 90s, there was, you know, a real sort of rock fan base uh, and then today you know there are massive 
uh, festivals, well, not, not obviously in the last few months, but there were, are, you know, large rock festivals attended by tens and tens of thousands of people in, in many cities all over China. Hmm. So, what, yeah, maybe we should, we should step back and talk a little about the, um, kind of cultural interchange between the U.S. and, um, and China generally as a prelude to that part of your life, because I, I think we, uh, uh, speaking only for myself, I've kind of lost track. I mean, of <laughs> course, there was, you know, I was, I'm old enough to vaguely remember Nixon's opening to China and ping pong diplomacy and, you know, Kissinger engineered detente and so on. And I know that the, the, the first big kind of, I guess economic reformer was Deng Xiaoping. Is that safe to say? That's correct. Yeah. And that and that starts when? So 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 the shift toward something more like a market economy starts when? And really, in 1979. At the very end of 1978, uh, there were uh, there was a plenary session of the 11th Party Congress, the third plenary session of the 11th Party Congress, where Deng actually made his uh, his big move. So 79 is really when you start to see the big shift. And I made my first trip to China as a, a lad of 15 in 81 and went back again in 86. And I credit that, just the difference that I saw there in just in those five years as the reason that I decided to sort of hitch my wagon to China. Uh, I just saw just the momentum and the trajectory of change in China as just being so profound just across those five years. You saw sort of the, the light in people's eyes change. Uh, it was and, like a software change that was happening. Yeah. And was American culture seeping in as part of that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, I mean, it, it's never really stopped. If you look today, I mean, so many of the most popular television shows right now are, um, you know, around hip hop, um, mm -hmm. you know, around, uh, different forms of, of music and, uh, comedy and all these things that you would recognize as un, un, undeniably American in origin. Mm hmm. And I, by the way, I, f I forgot to, to plug the rock and roll group that you co-founded. Tong Dynasty is That's the name, correct. right? Tong Dynasty. And people can presumably go to YouTube and yeah, yeah, and YouTube listen or Spotify or whatever. Or uh, actually, yeah, I, actually, I, I, do let it. me let me plug my my other more recent and I, I actually would say better band, which was called Spring and Autumn or Trinchio, C H U N Q I U, or also on Spotify. We only put out one record that was in two thousand five, two thousand six, uh, but I think yeah. It's more representative of what I do. Now, is that, uh, was that in China that, that you That was in China, yeah. That was in China. I was the only non-Chinese member of both of those bands and, uh, non, you know, Chinese by nationality. I'm ethnically Chinese, but. Uh huh. Okay. Now, um, you, you know, a lot, a number of people are concerned about, um, a deterioration of U.S. and Chinese relations. Um, and then some people are not concerned. They're rejoicing and, and trying to facilitate it. Uh, I've listened to enough of your podcast that I know that for you, the concern is in some ways personal, right? Oh, deeply, deeply personal. Look, I mean, I'm somebody who for most of my life, I've counted myself as extremely lucky to be, I mean, I, I can safely say without any exaggeration or boast that I, I feel like I'm a legitimate cultural sort of inheritor to two civilizational traditions, to two, two civilizations um, that I can kind of, you know, reach out effortlessly and claim, you know, Euro-American, Western civilization as mine and Chinese civilization as mine. And that's always just been something I've been um, not just proud of, but felt very privileged to have. And, it, you know, there were always tensions. There was always sort of, you know, a tug one way or the other, but not like, like, Today, I mean, now it really feels like, uh, you know, my, my very soul is being torn. It's pretty tough. It's, it's, it's a lot of people have written to me about the show and say they've detected sort of a note of despondency. Um, and I have to, I have to confess, yeah, I, I do feel it sometimes. It's been pretty rough. And that begins when, I mean, of course, one threshold was the pandemic, but, but that, that was not by, that was a long way from being the first sign of tension between the U.S. and China. So when do you date your kind of uh, despondency to? Yeah, I mean, it's been basically uh, the entire history of the show has been sort of a, a chronicle of this uh, because there really was uh, a rift that began right after the financial crisis. So this has been going on for about 12 years now. Uh, I think most people who watch China can, would probably date it to then – 
Uh, so really for the entire history, the, t- the whole time I've been doing Seneca in a couple of years before, we've watched as not only has China taken an illiberal turn, but uh, U.S.-China relations have, have started to be strained. Now, this didn't really come to any kind of a head until really the Trump administration. It was bad, but I think it was mm-hmm. not irreparable the way that it seems to have become now. There was always a deep well of goodwill that could be drawn on uh, in China. I mean, you look back to some of the the pretty horrible things that have happened, you know, the bombing of the U.S. embassy or the Chinese embassy by the U.S. in in, in Belgrade. Now, by the way, was, it, was the American explanation that that was an accident, was that accepted uh, by Chinese people broadly and by the government? To, to date, I don't think I've met a single Chinese person uh, who uh, – isn't himself or herself just sort of deeply steeped in? I mean, that is, you know, who hasn't lived in America for a long time, who doubts, for, uh, who think, who accepts that for a second. They mm-hmm. do not believe it was an accident. They have always believed that it was deliberate, <laughs> and that's that's actually, you know, the, one of the proximate causes for the band having broken up in '99, or for my having. Is departed. that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, how did that elaborate on that? Oh uh, man. Okay, so. Uh, we had, I mean, there, there were other underlying issues. I mean, I think the, the most important one I should, you know, be very upfront about is that, uh, I was, I mean, I came from privilege. You know, I, for me, it was just sort of a lark, the whole rock band thing. I never thought that that was going to, you know, be what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Um, it was, and I'm not a particularly great guitar player by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, it was like landing on a low gravity planet at the time. Just, you know, my modest skills looked pretty, you know, pretty impressive back then. Uh, I so, want to go to a country like that where yeah, all my, it's all my talents it's, will be magnified. There aren't many of them left. Yeah. <laughs> there aren't many left, unfortunately. You know, damned internet and all, YouTube, they're all good. Yeah. But, um, back then, I, I really felt like, um, I mean, I, I realize this now, just looking back, that I uh, was the, I was the one who was, you know, tugging us in the direction of let's just play, you know, this really complex artsy stuff that, you know, with 12 minute long epic songs, and who cares if we're never on the radio? We're doing this for us, right? Uh, which was just, I mean, I, I feel kind of bad because the rest of the guys in the band were trying to really make a living at it, and so. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean that was that was in the background, but I think you know we had a kind of a Yoko Ono situation, as they as they say in the business. Who um, was married to Yoko? Uh, so was that it, you? dating? No, it wasn't me. It was our lead singer. It was you know very standard Spinal Tapish stuff where I was Nigel <laughs> Tufnell and he was David St. Hubbins. Uh, you know he was my best friend back then. We, we we're now sort of on speaking terms again finally, but uh, he you know, we had a pretty big rift over. But it was the embassy bombing. So uh, on that morning uh, when. I, I got a phone call and was told that the embassy had been bombed. Uh, the two of us and my then girlfriend, what we went down to the U.S. embassy and watched the demonstrations happening, watched people throwing rocks, watched them attack the Albanian embassy of all things. And, um, you know, they, they, the just, time, they, get, they just got confused or something. Yeah, no, you know, the Kosovars, right? They're Albanian. Oh, right. right? Okay. So okay. Yeah, it's all coming back. Somehow, yeah, yeah. Our intervention yeah. was kind of on behalf of uh, the Kosovars. Okay. Well, got I it. mean, but not of the Albanian state, right? It was these right. ethnically Albanian people. Anyway. Right. Um, so that afternoon, we got a phone call from our manager uh, summoning us to this, what was billed as a peace concert in Shenzhen uh, the, the following day. So we got on a plane the next day, and we went down to Shenzhen to play what was supposed to be this peace concert. And, of course, it wasn't. It was an anti-American rally. And uh, everyone was wearing these these T-shirts in different colors in different sections of, of the audience that all said, you know, 中国人今天说不 you know, the Chinese people say no today. The Chinese people stand up and say no. Or whatever. And uh, it, it was already bad, but uh, it, I was, I did a live TV spot for Phoenix TV, which would, was one of the, prep, the, the, the sponsors of the thing. And they swung a camera into my face and it was, it was a live feed. And they said, as an American here, uh, what do you think of, of, of this situation? And I spoke out of school. I was kind of dumb. I mean, I, I, I should have been a little more sensible about it. I said, you know, I'm here in the interest of peace, and by peace, I don't mean just peace between, uh, you know, the the Kosovars and and the Serbs, not just between NATO and the, the Yugoslav Republic, but also between the United States and China after this tragic, tragic accident. And I said, you know, I said this in Chinese, mm. and um, the word accident just made everyone just, uh, they were very, very mad. So they swung the camera away from me, and then my bandmates basically just were were so pissed at me. Um, 
we get up on stage and the, the lead singer, he's, you know, again, my best friend, he looks at me really telling, I mean, this is, this is sound check or whatever. Uh, the sound check was, was funny. I, I was there under this mock up of the, uh, the bombed out embassy complex in, in styrofoam and wood. And it was like teetering. And I thought, you know, the, the supremely spinal tapish I was just thinking would be of me being crushed by this. <laughs> yeah, to, to just like, I would, I'll die right now and that'll Stonehenge. be. Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, so, so they actually, that was part of the set. So yeah, this was yeah. like an impromptu concert. Really quickly put together. Yeah. Oh, and, I mean, and, the setting of it was really bizarre because it was this place called Windows on the World in Shenzhen, which still exists. And it's a, it's a sort of mall-like uh, setup. So there's this big grass mall. And flanking the, the, the two sides of the mall are these uh, miniature versions of of monumental architecture from around the world. So there's an Arc de Triomphe. And there's, a you know, an Eiffel Tower and a Taj Mahal. And uh, so it was supposed to be sort of, you know, international, but... Uh, I thought there was a, a real irony. <laughs> so you kind of immediately became persona non grata in China? Uh, not in China. I would, I mean, I did, I got, you know, I got clobbered in the face with a beer mug by one guy. Um, that was a, it was a, yeah, there, there were, I uh, got a, a few scrapes because, you know, I, I ran my mouth. Um, I, I don't know where to come down right now. I mean, I've, I've read so many accounts now that, that claim that, you know, China was providing signals intelligence to the Milosevic regime and, uh, that the, it was in fact, you know, done deliberately, but I have no idea. I mean, I usually just sort of went with this Occam's razor of if it's between conspiracy and stupidity, go with stupidity, right? As a rule, although I've got to say some things. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. I just, yeah. Um, uh, it, it seems to be getting harder to always go with stupidity in the world. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But um, the uh, okay. So anyway, you you felt your your continued uh, status there as a rock star was not tenable, and you uh... <laughs> yeah yeah. So I fortunately this is just a month ago, about a month or so later is when I formally left the band after we had this fight. Uh, and I went home and, and, and basically opened my computer up and thought, okay, what the hell am I going to do? Am I going to go back and finish my PhD at Arizona? Am I going to stay here, start another band? But then I, it occurred to me that there were all these, uh, VCs circling around China, all putting money into internet companies and that some of them needed, you know, capable editorial people. Mm -hmm. And I figured, hey, I, I write, I, I could probably, I mean, I'm bilingual and I can, uh, I know my way around the, the sort of celeb scene. They'll probably hire me to do something. And, and I just, with that thought, I closed my computer and went to sleep. And the next morning, uh, I get this phone call from Marcus Broccoli, who was, uh, I, I know him you slightly. You know Marcus, yeah. Uh, I'm sure I you haven't do. seen him in a long time, but he was for a while the editor of the Wall Street Journal. When I met him, he was the China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Exactly. This was in the nineties. So he called me up and he, he was, you know, he's running some side hustles. He had invested in this internet company and he thought, Hey, are you available now? I mean, is there a way we could talk to you about an editorial position at this new internet company I've, I've invested in? And, you know, I guess the, ne the next week I was down in Shanghai interviewing with their COO, uh, and we got hired as, uh, an internet guy, <laughs> just the editor in chief nominally of this, uh, this, this internet startup called China Now. Just a whole ton of fun. Let me interject that I was wrong to say he's editor of the Wall Street Journal. He's editor of the Washington Post. That's right. National and he, editor. And then he actually uh, had to resign because the Post got caught in some kind of side hustle. It's a long story, but there was a tension between one of their commercial money-raising enterprises and their journalistic integrity. It wasn't, wasn't his fault, but I think nah, he got caught Marcus, in the crossfire. Marcus the, the, is just a, a mensch. He's an absolute Yeah, mensch. I really liked him. I really yeah. liked him. Um, the... Uh, and 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 then you eventually wound up uh, working at Baidu at some point, right? Which is the, did, ch the, yeah. the China's kind of version of Google. Yeah, I mean, people say that. I think that's 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 you know uh, an exaggeration. Uh, but uh, yeah, I I spent a few years, you know, after that that collapsed in two thousand two after the bubble. It was a little bit later than the the U.S. bubble, but uh, I you know had been working in editorial and really close to technology. So it sort of made sense for me to, to turn myself into a technology correspondent, which is what I did. I just freelanced for a little while. Then I got hired by uh, the Red Herring. You remember that? It used the to be magazine? Sort of the, yeah, the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, I was their Asia correspondent, uh, bureau chief, whatever that meant. Um, 
of, of a bureau of one. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've, I've had a job like that. Yeah. So it did that for a few years. It was Mark, it was sort of Mark II, the, the bad era of, of the red herring when it was, you know, thin and printed on crappy paper. Uh, but it was, it was a good, it was good training. And yeah. at the end of that, I mean, all tech writers get poached by, uh, by, Chinese, Chinese technology companies, right? They always want, you know, these tech correspondents because, you know, they, they know how the news business works. They, they're well sourced and, you know, they, they know all the other reporters. And so, uh, I went first to this company called Yoku, which was, uh, a, an internet video company, sort of like YouTube, YouTube ish or Hulu ish. And mm-hmm. then I got poached by Baidu in 2010. Mm-hmm. Now, um, so I guess maybe we should quickly resume a, a kind of chronology I guess we were doing about the deterioration of relations. I'd start out with me asking you when your despondency began, uh, and you 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 answered that well, deter- uh, relations with the U.S. began to deteriorate after the U.S. financial crisis and there was the, the embassy bombing. Um, no, that was that was a decade before, but that was a de- okay. Yeah, yeah. No. Sorry, that, that was the, de- the decade before. Um, what, was this because the the U.S. was kind of blamed for the? I mean, not unreasonably, but blamed for the financial crisis of two thousand eight. It's really complicated. I think that um, you know that was obviously part of it. I think that you know a lot of Chinese people felt like the U.S. had bungled its stewardship of the global economy, and I think with good reason. Uh, not that China had no part in it. I mean, it was sort of enabling you know America to spend way beyond live way beyond its means. Uh, not that I necessarily think, you know, that there's some moral parity there, but, uh, it, it actually goes back further than that. I mean, we talk about an illiberal turn having happened in China, you know, in that period, 08, 09. A lot of people would, would recognize that, that that was the case. There was a real tightening down. Uh, you started to see, you know, much more strict internet censorship. You started to see crackdowns on, on, uh, rights groups, on lawyers. The lawyers crackdown started even a few years before 08. But, um, to say that it was an illiberal turn implies that the period before that was less illiberal or, you know, I would go so far as to say relatively liberal. Uh, we kind of jokingly for a few years were calling it the golden age of Hu Jintao. But yeah, it, it really was. Um, and, and I look at the period from it really, you know, when did that start? We, we talked about the embassy bombing, uh, you know, n- by 99, things had already gotten pretty bad even before the embassy bombing. Maybe not everyone remembers, but there was this Taiwan Straits crisis, uh, right before the first democratic election in Taiwan. China started lobbing missiles into the strait and, you know, mm-hmm. there, were, there was a lot of saber rattling. Um, uh, and actually Clinton parked, uh, two carrier groups of the seventh fleet in, at the mouth of the Taiwan Strait at one point. So things were pretty t- tense. And they had gotten worse. I mean, in April, very early April of 2001, um, I don't know if you remember, there was a, an, an American spy plane, an EP-3, that uh, had a, a collision yeah. just yeah. really close to the Chinese coast in airspace that China had claimed. Uh, there was a, a, a Chinese pilot who was supposedly hot-dogging and clipped the wing of the EP-3, and it had to, to land. It had to do an emergency landing on Hainan Island in, in the Gulf of Tonkin. So... Things were pretty bad, but then uh, September 11th happens, and all of that just goes away. Suddenly, mm-hmm. the U.S. no longer looks like it, it's it's interested in in making China entity number one. Obviously, it's pursuing the so-called global war on terror. And in that time, sort of astonishingly, uh, there is a uh, a real change that happens in China. I mean. I would go so far as to call it a, a liberalization. Uh, there's a advancement in almost all the things that most of us Americans want to see in China. You know, better rule of law, uh, you know, uh, less uh, overt persecution of minority populations in China, uh, a flourishing of, of, of relatively free media. You suddenly saw all these new media organizations blossom. Really, I mean, and NGOs too, just, you know, the third sector just took off like crazy after September 11th. And in that period, there are other reasons why. It's not just that America left, you know, shifted its attention elsewhere, but that is an important factor. So, so you mean, but, but because America got kind of distracted by the war on terror, China felt less threatened by America. Absolutely. America was less diligently policing kind of uh, Asia, and so China, the less threatened it, it felt, the more it, it felt it could open up. 
And you might think that's strange because, you know, the dominant uh, you know, sort of foreign policy, you know, uh, uh, what would you call it, sort of the, 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 the policy framework that was in play during the, the Bush 43 period was, of course, you know, neoconservatism, right? The doctrine of, doctrine of preemption and all of this stuff and regime change was on the menu. But Beijing understood that that was not directed at Beijing, right? That was not, that was for tin pot dictatorships in, in the mm-hmm. Middle East. That was for, you know, countries that, that the United States could steamroll. Uh, so they weren't nervous about that. And I think that the, the Bush administration, well, you know, they had enrolled China in the global war on terrorism. All they had to do was just sort of put the name of one so-called terrorist organization that China had always been going on about, you know, this, this East Turkestan Islamic movement on a list of terror organizations and great, let's shake hands and do business. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I, I think what, what happened toward the end though is that, uh, there, there were a, 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 a really, it was an unfortunate confluence of a bunch of things. Uh, you talked about, you asked me earlier about cultural exchange, right? About, mm-hmm. you know, where that started off and you, you had rattled off a bunch of stuff, you know, about, uh, what ping pong diplomacy and, and whatnot through the eighties and through the nineties. And even up until the early part of the 2000s, there still wasn't that much by way of cultural exchange. Most of the encounters between Chinese and Americans were, they were not, you know, they were intermediated. They were formal. They were in, mm-hmm. they were taking place in settings like, you know, sister city meetings or trade delegations from one to the other. And everyone was on their best behavior. Nobody was eager to offend. Uh, that changed. In the mid 2000s, in the middle aughts, you started to see that first cohort of people who had been trained from a young age, uh, in English in China, and they were getting on the internet for the first time. So they were suddenly encountering Americans in a sort of an unintermediated format online mm-hmm. in the comment sections of, of, you know, Guardian articles or Economist articles, and they, were not seeing either. They were suddenly very interested in seeing what the the West thought of China as it was about to have its big coming out party with the you know the Olympics. So there was all these. There was a reason for them to to see what they were saying. Uh, there there was the medium by which they could do it, and there was the language by which they could they could do it. And they didn't like each other. They discovered that they did not see at all eye to eye. Uh, you know, the, the the U.S. seemed to have some crazed obsession with Tibet. You know, and then, you know, in 08, if in March of 08, Lhasa exploded in these, this big uprising in this right, and not just Lhasa, but also cities around in western Sichuan, in, in Tibetan areas of western Sichuan. And suddenly you see, I mean, if you think back to 99, right, after the embassy bombing, uh, there was online vitriol, but there were only like a million and a half people on the internet. Mm-hmm. If you fast forward to 2006 or so, Suddenly, you know, you have 30 million, 40 million, 50 million people online, over a hundred million probably. And, uh, it, it was not easy to tame. It was just, there were people that were, were forming these sort of online hacker unions. There was this group called Anti CNN, which was dedicated to exposing all the, the media lies that were told about, about China. Uh, so you have a, a confluence of this sort of popular dissatisfaction with the Western narrative, but also, a, a new sheriff in town in the United States, uh, you know, you have the Obama White House. Now, Obama himself, you know, he was uh, saying all the right things. He was saying, you know, that a strong and prosperous and stable China is in, in our interest. But he had, you know, Susan Rice and Samantha Powers, people like that mm-hmm. who were, you know, real sort of, they called them what, uh, you know, liberal hegemonists. The, the, uh, the Chinese word is liberal interventionists. And, they were very, very wary of this. They, they, they thought they attributed authorship of most of the color revolutions to this bunch, right? Mm-hmm. And as, as, as strange as that may seem to us, that's precisely how, how the Chinese saw it. Uh, so, they really, yeah. yeah. So let's, um, <clears throat> so on, on this point. So I, I think in one, uh, in one American narrative, like, uh, you have this relatively liberal period in Chinese history that you've described kind of in the aughts and so on. And then in this simplified version, then Xi Jinping shows up as prime minister 
and he's more authoritarian. And that's when? 2010 or what? When, when so does he show up? 2012? He's not prime minister, but he's, yeah, he's, he's uh, president. president. Yeah. He's really, president is not a really accurate title either. We use it, but you know, he's general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. And he doesn't come into power until 2013. 2012, 2013. Like, yeah. And, and so you, I'm sure you've heard this simplified version of it. Right. It's not and, accurate. And it's, uh, in fact, I, I just read this, uh, essay by Frank Fukuyama. You may have seen it in the American interest. I did. And he was emphasizing that, well, the China's authoritarian turn is, is contingent, uh, by, by which he meant, you know, Xi Jinping. It could have been somebody else, but it was Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping was authoritarian. I think you're going to tell us that, that first of all, the tensions between the U.S. and China started growing earlier. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the relatively liberal turn in China had probably started earlier. But also you're suggesting that, uh, it didn't all start in China. In other words, some of, some of this, uh, was in reaction to things that the U.S. uh, was doing. Is that fair More to say? More accurately, in reaction to things that Beijing thought the U.S. was doing. Okay. They imputed a kind of, you know, coordination that probably wasn't there, but, you know, suddenly you see sort of, uh, you know, as the Olympics happen, look, if you're, if you're, if you're a human rights organization, if you're Amnesty or Human Rights Watch, and, uh, the global war on terror is going on, and that's all anyone can think about, uh, your, uh, your Tibet agenda, your, your, you know, Xinjiang agenda is just not gonna break through, it's not gonna cut through. But mm-hmm. if suddenly everyone is talking about China because they're about to host the Olympics, which you're is going what to you see that. 2008 or what? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, in 2007, uh, by two, you know, 2007, the only things that had really roiled the waters between the U.S. and China was, was Darfur, Darfur, but mm-hmm. that was a pretty minor issue. You know, I mean, not a minor issue if you were Steven Spielberg or, or if, if you're, uh, what's her name? Um, Gosh, can't remember her name now. Woody Allen's ex-wife. Mia, uh, Mia Farrow? Mia Farrow, right. Mia was, was very into the Darfur issue. But, you know, if most Americans didn't, couldn't, you know, didn't know what the Darfur issue was, who were the Janja we were, or what Chinese were doing to support them. I, I, listen, honestly, I don't even remember this. I mean, you may okay. want to refresh yeah, yeah. your memories so, quickly. To, to my point. I mean, I don't remember the Chinese, uh, the Chinese role clearly. What, so yeah. what? So, I mean, Spielberg, for example, he withdrew, he was originally supposed to be working with Zhang Yimou to do the whole sort of choreography for the opening ceremony of, of the Beijing Olympics, and he pulled out because of Darfur. But, you know, okay. I, I say this by, by way of saying that there was very little to royal the waters between mm-hmm. in, the, in the in the state-to-state relationship during those years. There was, you know, poisoned pet food, Chuck Schumer and Lindsey Graham were always up in arms about, you know, uh, about currency manipulation and things like that. But But these were not... Uh, issues on the same level as what we're looking at today, right? Uh, so suddenly though, by two, in 2008, you have a lot of people. You have all these, you know, people writing columns in the major American newspapers. You have this new administration now suddenly talking about, you have, you know, suddenly Tibet blows up. A year later, Xinjiang blows up. Uh, there, there's an awful lot that for them looks like, uh, the United States suddenly has Beijing in its sights again, and uh, all the, the various American institutions, whether it's you know the perennial boogeyman of you know the National Endowment of, for Democracy, or whether it's you know the State Department itself, Hillary Clinton was never you know considered to be uh, a friend to China. You know, I mean, it's from '95 on, you know, she was always considered to be suspect in in, in Beijing's eyes. So, yeah. So there's just a I, lot not, of criticism just, coming from American, various American players, including political ones. Right. That, and that this was, was not a, coordinated. This right. is values driven, but from Beijing's perspective, it mm-hmm. looks coordinated. Hmm. For even from the government's perspective, you oh, think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it really, and, and then of course it comes to a head. Obama's in office for a little while, and then suddenly they start talking about the pivot, right? Remember the pivot? Yeah, I was just talking about this, uh, uh, on a, on a thing I, I uh, recorded yesterday, we, or we posted yesterday, uh, you don't know Toby Chow, do you? I, I know who he is, yeah, Toby yeah, Chow. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, we were just saying, like, there, there's something about the American, there's something, uh, uh, about the constraints on an American president, president, and it kind of imposed by the national security establishment such that it's hard to just say, we're gonna, 
uh, de-emphasize the Middle East and withdraw some troops from there and just pull back. You kind of have to say we're going to move them somewhere else. We're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to shift our emphasis. You can't say we're going to pivot to America. You have to say we're going right. to pivot to Asia. Anyway, this was a big theme for uh, Obama. We're going to pivot to Asia, and it's one of you know a lot of the things you've mentioned are things that probably won't ring a bell even with a lot of Americans who pay a fair amount of attention. That's right. And, pi- and pivot to Asia is probably another one of those phrases, although I remember it, but. Uh, you know, we tend to forget how much resonance these things can have in certain other countries, and I'm sure right. Pivot to Asia got a lot of attention in China. Well, yeah, I mean, just like I said, you know, I've never met a Chinese person who saw the embassy bombing as anything but, you know, deliberate. I've never met any Chinese people who thought, saw the pivot to Asia or the rebalancing, as it was later rebranded, as anything short of some species of containment. They really did. Now, right. I don't believe that that's what it was intended to be. I think I... I I have had the the privilege of interviewing two of the principal authors of it, so Danny Russell and Kurt Campbell. I've both interviewed and asked them about this. No, they I don't. I take them at their word that it wasn't intended to be a sort of you know defense first sort of thing. But what what's what are the visible pieces of it? What are the things that happen first? Twenty five hundred American Marines are stationed in northern Australia, right? I mean, the defense piece of it happens not only faster, but more visibly, right? And so Mm -hmm. this is the thing, is there's a concept in in international relations called uh, security dilemma sensibility, right? It's the ability to see what what your behavior looks like from the other side. Mm -hmm. So to turn the chessboard around or whatever, to, to stand in the other guy's shoes, and we fail to exercise that. We we didn't we never really understood at how Beijing was perceiving our uh, policy shifts in the late 2000s. Yeah. And then it all came, I mean, of course, then Beijing picks up this real swagger after it survives the, 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 uh, economic, you know, turn, the downturn in, in 2008, 2009, four trillion yuan in stimulus later, you know, Beijing is still walking tall and, Looking at at America and really believing this this idea of American decline, so mm-hmm. it, it just goes to shit from there. And there's a little bit of an echo of that with the pandemic, right? The 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 idea that China had handled as we as we record this, this won't post for a few days, but as we record this, uh, there's been another uh, kind of outbreak in Beijing that they're dealing with. But, but basically, even so, I mean. Uh, they ha- with much less advanced warning than we had, uh, uh, they handled it, uh, more, more kind of d- decisively. Um, yeah. and, 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 and that, and so, and some people are saying, you know, well, they're, they're interpreting China's behavior differently, uh, uh, in different ways. But one is, you know, they, they've got their, you know, a little bit of swagger coming out of this. Um, the, uh, but, but I want to back up and just, you know, there's a more general term for the term you use, which is cognitive empathy. And yeah, I've actually heard you use word, that. Yeah. I, I've heard you use that on your podcast. I want to congratulate you. I, I'm trying to get everyone to use the term. Thank you. And, Thank you. and it's, it's because it is really, and, and, and it's distinguished from emotional empathy. It's related. It may give you emotional empathy and emotional empathy may give you cognitive empathy, but it's not about, feeling their pain. It's just about understanding how they view the world. That's right. It and requires my, it requires some some effort, right? You actually yeah. have to to learn something about their history. You need to learn something about their values, their belief systems, the religious systems, the the institutions, everything that sort of feeds into the worldview. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I I just think if everyone were way better at this, the world would be a much better place. It it, it just seems to me that a lot of international conflict is started by by a lack of um, cognitive empathy. Um, and although you're you're right that, uh, or at least I, I I agree that you know often you need to understand like really distinctive things about the actor in question. There are also some recurring themes that you see in failures of cognitive empathy, and one of one of them you've kind of already alluded to, which is that it's common for us, like in America, for example, to view as offensive things that other countries do that are actually motivated by a defensive kind of consideration. That's so, right. so most Americans would not imagine that China felt threatened by the various things you've just said China felt threatened by. Right. We just don't, we don't think that, but it's often the case. Right. And I mean, that's the thing. So you, you do need to understand that 89 for them 
it was a near death experience and and they uh felt the, very the, the, embassy, the embassy bombing no 89 so Tiananmen oh 80 oh Tiananmen okay so 89 felt like a near death experience to them and then what happened immediately after 89 they saw one after another eastern european countries uh just so then they saw the us sort of roll up uh basically to the the soviet border uh, and then the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91. And then even more, uh, so, so, you just have to think about the, uh, right. what does all of this look like from Beijing? And it's just, it's not that hard. I just don't think that, like, to your point, yeah, but it's you not know what's, that hard. You know, it's funny. Most people don't even understand what it looked like from the Soviet Union. I mean, a, a right. lot of Americans don't even understand that expanding NATO's borders, for example, uh, was, um, and I don't know when exactly that, Happen, I guess that's, After 91, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. Um, that that was, uh, viewed as threatening in, in Russia. And, um, but, but now I guess I'm hearing from you that that kind of thing was viewed as threatening in China. Is that? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. And so too was the Arab Spring, right? I mean, let's, let's, let's take one, one example, uh, that we're all familiar with is internet censorship, right? Uh, what do you think is going to happen if you're in Beijing sitting there and we suddenly, you know, this, you've had in, in, in 2008, you have this massive uprising in Tibet and then suddenly, you know, it's all of us. And in 2009, you have this thing with the Uyghurs. And then later that summer, you have what the American media decides to call the YouTube revolution, the green revolution in, in Iran after Ahmadinejad's reelection. Uh, and that's, that's really the first of the Arab Spring uprisings, right? I mean, we can, we can almost call it that. And then mm-hmm. Tunisia, uh, I don't, we didn't have a handy name for Tunisia, but we sure did for Tahrir Square. You know, we called that the Facebook revolution, right? There were a whole bunch of Twitter revolutions. So what's China doing? China is going, okay, Facebook got that, Twitter blocked, right? I mean, people were, were, were whispering about, you know, a Jasmine revolution in China. And of course, China's leadership is going to be very nervous about that. Um, yeah. It's just so- that, that, that sort of thing, right? So at this point, I would uh, just want to discourage a particular kind of reaction to the discussion we're having, which is like, oh, so you're saying China's not to blame for X, Y, Z, and it's America's fault? I would just encourage people throughout life, <laughs> as they go through life, to just when they're assessing what makes things go wrong, try to do the analysis without even thinking about who you, you're going to blame in the end, and just try to isolate the factors that – the things that might have been done differently that might have made a difference without ju- just save the question of blame for later or don't address it at all. But it just, it, to, it, to my mind, it gets in the way of clear analysis. And, and I right. just want to say, I'm not passing judgment one way or the other. I'm just, I, I, I do think very few Americans have entertained the possibility that ver- various of these things that America did, um, may have made things, um, where it's not just the sense of increasing um, antagonism toward America, but maybe making life worse for some Chinese who then had to deal with a less liberal society uh, That's right. uh, as a result. Absolutely. So I, I am not one of these people, first of all, who who says, look, uh, China is going to be China. Anything that we do is not going to make any difference, uh, you know, American policy will have no impact whatsoever on, on where China goes. And, and that, that's become this sort of, this deeply pessimistic re- response to this perceived failure of engagement, right? Uh, I think that's nonsense. I think that, like, we, we, we shouldn't pretend that we don't, there isn't something that America does want China. I mean, we do. I think most of us do, deep down, want China to become a more tolerant, more open, more participatory society and polity, right? I mean, I don't think we should be embarrassed to to say that. Uh, how we get there uh, is is a different matter. How we get there often might be by doing less, and that's that's actually the argument that I would make that we can actually do more by doing less. The less China feels threatened, the less it feels like it has this vision, uh, this American sort of uh, exceptionalist. Uh, morality sort of rammed down its throat, the more likely it is to actually move in that direction of its own. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, Robert, you, you, Bob, you, you, you're a guy who likes philosophy, right? Uh, Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like 
at the very heart of what's happening between China and the United States are a couple of deep philosophical questions. And I, I've, maybe you can help me puzzle through this because one of them is, is the, 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 your basic division between moral absolutism and, and, and ethical or cultural relativism, right? Mm-hmm. Was a time when the people on our side of politics on, on the American left were champions of 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 relativism of some sort. We not not the sort of slippery slope slide right down into nihilism kind of relativism, but we believed that like the range of possible change uh for a country was conditioned to a large extent by its culture, by its history, by its its economic conditions, by that you know that that you weren't going to see the same exact morality uh in in different settings. But that's changed. Right now, most Americans, I would, I would say, are absolutists of some sort or another. Either they're, you know, theologically grounded absolutists, or they're, you know, humanist grounded absolutists. Uh, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with that. The other sort of philosophical conundrum is between people who are, I mean, it's, it's about historiography, if, if that's a part of philosophy, I don't, I don't know. But there are people who, interpret history as deeply teleological and it's really baked into our language you know of the uh, the moral arc of history is long and but bends toward justice or, or the you're on the wrong side of history sort mm-hmm. uh, and then there are people who would say no history is entirely contingent right that there's an awful lot of just circumstance and happenstance and blind luck uh that that circumscribes what could can happen historically and you know who who Assigned to history a pretty high gravitational pull. It's hard to achieve you know, escape velocity from history. Um, and so I, I feel like where you come down on those two things kind of determines where you come down on, on understanding China. And I really want to urge people to examine their own teleological assumptions. And well, that's interesting. So, I mean, as for the first one, I think you're, um, well, it's certainly true. America is a very moralistic country, certainly in the conduct of its foreign policy. Absolutely, yeah. And it's a very moralistic country just domestically right now. It seems like the, all the big political tribes are, are really inordinately um, sure of themselves. Um, the uh, I think that's true. It's a pretty long-standing um, feature. I'm trying to, to, to think about the connection to teleology. I mean, I... I I, um, well, there's, I mean, technically you could distinguish between directionality and teleology. In other words, you could think that history tends to head in a certain place without positing purpose, strictly speaking. But that's, let's leave that aside. I mean, I've championed like a version of, of, of that in a book I wrote called, uh, Non-Zero, which, which, right. uh, which is very different from Fukuyama's version because mine was very uh, materialistic in in the in the way in what it saw as the driving forces. It was very much about kind of technology and stuff, and and Frank's book was more kind of Hegelian, yeah. uh, you know, and, and and so on. I mean, I'm curious what you what uh, what, what what your take is on this because it, it seems to me like um, the issue of kind of directional. Uh, a directional view of history, it seems to me, um, what do I want to say? On the one hand, on the one hand, what I like about it in kind of what you might call moral terms is that it's, it's assuming that there is some level at which people around the world are the same. In other words, you, you, you're not getting, um, too caught up in the differences among people and, and, and thinking that uh, for example, liberal values or something that can only be enjoyed by blah, 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 Americans, right. Caucasians, whatever it is you think. Um, on the other hand, there, there is danger in over extrapolating from your own historical experience and not taking due account of, uh, you know, cultural history and cultural distinctiveness in other areas and so on. So I'm, I'm curious as to what your take is on, on this, I, I, I think I, I can safely infer that you would like to see a little more in the way of cultural relativism in America. So would I, or at least just a less a less judgmental uh, attitude toward uh, other cultures. But I, I'm not sure I can predict how that 
translates into your view on directionality yeah, and no, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. I, I think it's something I, I would be irresponsible not to try to articulate. Uh, so I, I don't believe that, uh, my my version of relativism wouldn't go so far as to say uh that there are i mean it's not essentialist right i don't i don't wouldn't say that for example you know there's these asian values that would right. not, for, you know forever right. preclude uh people who come from this confucian tradition to ever embrace democracy i think that's patently false that's that's nonsense but can we say that uh, there are elements, the historical elements or cultural elements or, you know, political cultural pieces or historical experiences that, that limit the speed at which they can make that transformation. I think we can. I think that we can say that, that there are, that it throws up impediments. The other question is, like, should they make those transformations? And that, that's, that's where, you know, the sort of, uh, teleolo- teleology comes in. Um, and again, I'm not willing to say no. I'm not, uh, uh, that's what I was sort of starting off saying that I, I don't believe that there is no reason to, uh, to, 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 I don't believe there's a reason for us to stop ourselves from wanting to see society move in a particular direction, but I don't believe that there's, there's historical inevitability to it, nor do I believe, I think that, so, there were other ways of organizing truth in the world and knowledge about the world before we understood science, right? Mm-hmm. Science, uh, to the organization of, of fact in the world is to me sort of, uh, like, it's, 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 I, I would draw a metaphor between that and, and these liberal tenets like, you know, pluralism and, uh, free expression and freedom of conscience, uh, that to the organization of society and polity. So that these weren't lying there waiting just to, to, to inevitably be discovered. We weren't going to converge on them. But now that we know that science is an extremely useful way of establishing fact in the world, there's no reason that we shouldn't want all societies, even the ones that didn't experience, you know, the 17th century uh, or the 18th century enlightenment in, in, in France, uh, who didn't experience, you know, Darwin or, or what have you to, to land there. I mean, I, I, yeah, so that, that's where I am. I, I think that, that now that we know that these, these systems or organization exist, um, we can want people to, to get there, but in full knowledge that it, there wasn't an historical inevitability to it. So I feel like what's happening right now is so many Americans are standing on one side of this historical chasm. And looking across this chasm at Iran and Russia, at India, at China, and saying, just come over here. Just be like us. Come mm-hmm. on over to this side and everything will be great. And because we have Costco, we have great cable TV, we have, uh, you know, you're, you're going to love it. And if we bother to look down into that chasm, we would see that there are many narrow defiles through which humanity You know, we passed so many lucky throws of the die, so many just tosses of the coin, so many skin of the teeth escapes that, that, that got us here. And that so much of it was just because we had these tensions. I mean, Fukuyama, you mentioned Fukuyama. I love those two books that you wrote about the origins of political order and political order and Mm -hmm. political decay. Those those are big books. Great books, great books. But you know, he talks about the necessary sort of tensions that existed between like secular and ecclesiastical authority. And that, you know, how things like rule of law evolved out of that. There wasn't a universal church in, in China, right? He talks mm-hmm. about a, a lot of this stuff and he seems to have a deep appreciation for contingency, which is ironic because he's the guy who's always, you know, being pinned for, you know, the teleological view of, of history. But I think he was really onto something there. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what I, I think people should, should take away. Yeah. I mean, I guess I also wish Americans would appreciate not, not just that maybe they were lucky to get to where they got, but it's uh it's not entirely clear that you'd rather be where they are than where any number of other societies are. I mean, Costco's right. great. I mean, especially at this point in American history. I mean, increasingly, I think Americans are kind of realizing it's like, who are we to preach? We need to get our own country together. This is like, yeah. uh things are not good. But um this is, I, I'm just reiterating the idea of cultural relativism, that different, you know, that... uh 
uh, there are things that that you can point to about America that are quite suboptimal that are not that are not uh, shared by other you know whether it's incarceration rate uh, all kinds of things. But um, I digress, I guess. Um, so let's see, where does this uh, leave us? Uh, <laughs> where do you think it leaves us? Well, I mean, it, it still leaves us with this the current predicament that we're in and how we get out. I mean, I if you look at where we are right now, I, I just I'm pretty despondent. I mean, I look at, we've got two political parties that are sort of out trying to, uh, trying to out, outflank one another on who can be tougher on China. We have, yeah. uh, I, I don't see any evidence that, that, uh, we're thinking through these things. I don't see any evidence that we're ready to challenge, you know, the, that, that sort of stranglehold that American exceptionalism has had on us for so very long. I, I think we're not willing to recognize how our response to China's rise has been so fundamentally emotional. You know, I mean, yeah. there are pieces of it. It's like, I get it. You know, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that. Yes, you were always top dog. You know, we were always top dog. Uh, we've never faced a, a near peer competitor on multi-dimensional axes like this before. And they're not white, right? I mean, Kyron Skinner, I, 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 a couple of people have, have, you know, taking me to task for my immediate reaction to remember what Kyron Skinner said. Do you remember who she was? No. So she was. You you, you probably remember this. Um. So Anne Marie Brady. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um. Oh, Anne Marie Slaughter. Anne Marie Slaughter was interviewing the former. Now you know, she's left her position. Oh, she was, right, right. No, I heard this on your podcast actually. But yeah, tell us, tell us. Yeah, yeah. So she she was uh, director of of policy planning at the State Department. Mm-hmm. And she's a woman of color. She's an African-American woman, uh, sort of a protege of Condoleezza Rice. And she was uh, talking about uh, how China had, I mean, how the U.S. had never faced a non-Caucasian competitor before. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just went to town on her just saying, you know, oh, that's nonsense. We know, uh, obviously, there was Japan before. And, and you know, how can you say this? Um, but I think she was actually making a different point which was that there is a racial component to our anxieties about China's rise. Mm-hmm. And we're not confronting that. We're yeah, also the- not, I think, wrestling squarely with, look, I mean, it's, this is this is stuff that, you know, you, you, you try to talk to people about it and they think you, you ought to go put a tin hat, tinfoil hat on. But we used to talk pretty openly about the influence that the, uh, the military industrial complex or the security industrial well, Dwight complex. Dwight Eisenhower coined the phrase. That's right. Yeah. We used to talk about that and, and its influence, uh, on, on, you know, politics. It, mm-hmm. it looks suspiciously to me like that's, that's in play today. And yet we, we don't hear people outside of, you know, maybe you hear it from, and there's voices in the wilderness, uh, our, uh, friends right now at, 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 uh, at certain think tanks. I mean, I'm like thinking of the Quincy, the Quincy Institute. Institute. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've heard it kind of on the left, but that's kind of a problem because you, 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 it, it, it tends to get intertwined with a pretty extreme characterization of American foreign policy right. as a, as a really concerted imperialist plot. And I, and I think it's, it, it's American foreign policies, uh, a little less well thought out than that, actually. I mean, I think. I mean, part of it is is that it's the left's fault for that. I mean, for making it so cartoonish. Well, that that's kind of what I'm saying. Right, is right. like uh, is like, I don't. You know, as I was saying, actually, to Max Blumenthal, who's on the left, who's on my podcast, and I like him a lot, but I, I just differed on this one point. I said, I don't think Samantha Power wakes up every morning thinking, how can I sustain the American empire? That's not where I, – I mean, you know, she she has these interests in, in, in human rights, and they and they have led her to favor – Intervention she saw as humanitarian, and it winds up looking like imperialism because we keep intervening everywhere. But right. I don't, I don't see it as a plot. Now I do. I mean, to get back to the the cognitive empathy thing, I think another place where this shows up is um, in our uh, interpreting China's behavior in its own region. Now I, I want to say that I do think uh, Taiwan is a genuine kind of problem. Uh, it's an ally of ours. I, I think if it's people want to have their own country, they should have one and on and on. So it's a complicated issue. But in general, 
uh, what China seems to want on its periphery um, is what America always uh, assumed as a birthright when it was a rising power. Right. I, I mean, you've heard of the Monroe Doctrine probably, and we went a lot further afield than that. I, I mean, sure. we have asserted uh, the right to dominate in a much broader geographic terrain than China has so far asserted it. Right. And, I, and I'm not saying that's – look, I think border disputes should be resolved – Peaceably, Peaceably, logically, absolutely. and so on. Um, although I think a, an American failing has been to not use the post-Cold War period to more fully establish structures and norms for doing things like that. Exactly. You know, like yeah. building up, nurturing international law and respect for it and so on. But uh, but I, I do want to say that, I, I mean, in a way it gets back to our reading more into uh, – the the behavior of other countries then may be in order. I I I um I don't see signs that China wants to rule the world or rule America. I see signs that they want to uh be the dominant power in their neighborhood and I'm not saying that's good, but I would say it's what we always took for granted. Right. Yeah, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna suggest that I, I'm ready to cede spheres of influence to China or anything like that. I I, I think that's that's got its own set of problems. Uh but I, w- I would say that a lot of, of our reaction to this and, and why it seems to be so, so hyperbolic, I mean, you know, how many people have lost their lot, how much shipping has been interdicted in the South China Sea, despite, you know, China having built these, these, these islands, we do seem to sort of blow a lot of this out of proportion. We, we talk about, you know, China as this bellicose and expansionist power, but show me where China has gone to war since 1979. I don't, don't don't really see it. I just it's really it's just not there. I mean, they haven't shot fired shots in anger. Even <laughs> right now, what's what's happening in on the Sino Indian border? So far, no shots fired. Thank God. I mean, it's uh, it's still it's horrible. But uh, look, yeah, we should say. I mean, since people may not know when we record, this is after the incident that uh, killed led to the deaths of twenty Indian uh, Indians and, and and some unknown number of Chinese probably, but there were no, uh, they, they both did abide by this agreement not to use actual guns right. apparently during this. So it was a little more, uh, well, crude. I mean, it's, there's two ways to look at that. I mean, it's even maybe more, more savage, right? I mean, it's easier yeah, to shoot somebody like, from 120 st- yards away than to yeah. stab somebody with a bayonet up close. But, yeah. The, um, so, uh, no, and it, what I was going go with this is that, that there's, there's this moral layer to so much of how we think about China right now. And this is, this brings up, I think, one of the, the, the most difficult problems that people like you and me will have to actually confront. People who, who do not want to see this mad rush toward, I mean, we're, we're, we're sleepwalking t- into a, a genuine conflict with China right now, but, you know, part of it is that there is this moral layer. Uh, we, we, uh, look at the atrocity in Xinjiang and things like that, and that gets put into the pile uh, of reasons why we should, you know, pronounce China this this regime is. Now this is, is the, evil. the Uyghurs here, the treatment of the That's Uyghurs. That's right, the treatment of the yeah. Uyghurs. Uh, and you know, there's there's we need to come up with a way to 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 you know we, we need a foreign policy uh, that. Uh, it's 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 a it's a really tough one. I mean that 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 one for me is is one of the thorniest issues that we have to face. Yeah. But but to, to 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 especially when it comes to these ethnic groups in, in China, that we have to recognize how that discourse has been used by the neo cold warriors and the hawks in in the West mm-hmm. to to help to demonize China. But at the same time, we have to have thoughtful ways of addressing that that issue because. You know, it isn't something we can just sit by and and and, and watch without. But I, I'm interested in in how, you know, somebody with your worldview approaches these sorts of things. When you see pretty arguable cases of of gross human rights violations in mm-hmm. a country, uh, but you recognize that there's danger in those being weaponized. Yeah. I I mean I guess. Uh... A couple of things. I have, maybe to a fault, a reflex about just pointing out the closest things to analogs on our part. And I would remind people of the Japanese-American internment during World War II. That was pretty damn egregious. Um, and, and it wasn't good. And what, what China's doing to the Uyghurs is certainly not good. 
but we would have not felt that anyone was entitled to invade our country over it, right? I, I mean, right. There, there's a limit to the amount of intervention that any of us would say uh, was warranted, even in our periods of most egregious abuse of of, of human rights. Um, the uh, and then I, I, I try to I try to guard ag- against uh, I think you know hyperbolic characterizations. Like I think the term concentration camp. I mean, to me, that just connotes. Auschwitz, and I just think that's n- clearly not what's going on there. What's going on there is terrible. Um, and I don't think we have a super clear idea of exactly what it is, exactly what the magnitude of it is, kind of um, quantitatively, but it's clearly, uh, you know, people on the basis of their ethnicity and maybe uh, some added cues that the government is using as criteria are, are basically, as I understand, being forcibly confined, and 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 they're trying to. Um, you know, just almost stripped the cultural software out of their out of their brains in a certain sense. You know, yeah, no, that, that seems to be what's happening. This is exactly the, the problem that I, I have. I and I, you know, been in a lot of conversations about this. Um, right now, though, if if you're we, we look at um, the example that you raised of of internment camps in in the United States, we come around to a position where we recognize that, where most of us recognize that as an evil, right? That was a, a terrible mistake, that it was deeply unethical, uh, and we will not do that again, or we hope that we will not do that again. Uh, how did we get to that point, right? And and how does China get to that point? So I, I've, I've been in conversations with a lot of people about this, this very topic. One thing that's not working is... Right now, I think what we do tends to galvanize your average Han Chinese person who might have a shared experience of, of repression, who might otherwise be empathetic, who might be able to, to, to recognize that what's happening to his fellow countrymen in Xinjiang is, is a wrong. But because it's been weaponized, because it now looks like it's part and parcel of a campaign to demonize China, to eventually, you know, to delegitimize the Communist Party and eventually affect regime change, there's a natural resistance to it. And mm-hmm. how do we get past that? I mean, that's that's just a tough one for me. It's a yeah. really difficult. I mean, I, th- I think the one thing that uh, in, that that our, our the internment of Japanese Americans in this have in common is that when nations or regimes feel sufficiently threatened they will resort to extreme measures. That's right. Um, I think the regime feels very threatened by by what's going on with the Uyghurs. I don't know enough to understand exactly why, although in a way I should. I mean, it, it has something in common with what seems to me uh, an overreaction on America's part to a perceived threat from uh, radical Islam or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I think uh we invaded at least as many countries as was absolutely necessary um in in the course of responding to to 911 and um you know that in retrospect i think a lot of people say yeah i guess that was kind of an overreaction but you know it doesn't take that much to to make people feel threatened by something whether the threat is for external or um internal right. and and in some ways internal threats are the scariest uh, yeah, yeah. uh but uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a segue there because the, um, uh, we didn't finish off this question of, I, I think we left the story, uh, dangling around 2010 or, or, or something. What, what I wanted to ask you was, you, you had talked about how America actually, unbeknownst to it, had done some things that made China feel threatened, uh, and not just the American government, sometimes Americans, prominent Americans, Criticizing China, sometimes the government, um, sometimes that actually, uh, probably led to some constriction of, uh, the rights enjoyed, uh, by Chinese, um, or led to a less liberal China, uh, internally than might have been the case otherwise. Um, do you think it led, uh, or played a role in the, the elevation of Xi Jinping? To, uh, the leadership because, um, you know, a lot of people, again, take that as the key contingency. Like this guy with a, an authoritarian streak happened to wind up running the country. But did we, um, did America help create an environment in which he had the inside track? Uh, 
Yeah, you know, I think that that to to some extent, yeah. I think, like I said, there were there were other reasons why uh, there was a kind of looseness in the way that China was governed in the period between 2003 and 2000. Let's say 2012. Uh, part of it was, as I said, that you know, the China didn't feel a, a, the real external threat. Uh, but the other part of it was that. Both by design and just by default, China was, uh, during the time of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, was consensus driven. It, there, there was a, a sort of, he was maybe prime minister to Paris at best, uh, and there's a reason why we don't talk about that, that time as the Hu Jintao. We always add in his premier, you know, Wen Jiabao as well. And, and it was a time when the, the people on the Politburo Standing Committee were all sort of titans in their own right. They all had, uh, really sort of deeply entrenched, uh, interest bases, like Zhou Yong Kong, for example, was so, he owned the whole sort of petroleum sector. He was sort of a satrap of, 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 of that. Um, so it, there was a lot of corruption. There was, a, a lot of inefficiency. People talk about it as 10 wasted years. A, a, a lot did not get done during that time. Uh, and so that was a lot of the impetus for wanting somebody with, you know, a much stronger, uh, leadership style to come in. I mean, ironically, this was what a lot of Americans were, were, were insisting was mm-hmm. necessary for China. Um, you know, a stronger hand on the till, pillar. I think what we, what we've seen though is that I think people don't r- remember, I mean, okay, so, I, Jane Perlez, uh, who is a, a journalist I really respect, uh, she's on a sabbatical New right York now. She's, Times. Yeah, yeah, from New York Times. She was, yeah, she was a Pulitzer Prize winning correspondent and has been on my show a few times. She came and gave a talk about a, uh, project she's working on to understand the rise of Xi Jinping, to understand Xi Jinping himself. And, you know, it's something that I think we, a lot of us should be paying attention to. And she told the story about how in, uh, the year or so, Prior to his actual assumption of, of the office, she talked to a lot of really well-known China watchers, experts uh, who, who you know, have known, seen his different incarnations, knew his father, knew, knew all that. And uniformly, they all believed that he was going to be uh, uh, some sort of, if not just a market liberalizer, you know, actually somebody who was going to be pursue political liberalization to some extent. Nobody went hmm. so far as to call him the next Gorbachev or anything like that. But... Uh, she was, she just sort of set this up by way of saying, ha, how wrong they were, how completely wrong they were. And then she just went on. And I, when Q&A time came around, I raised my hand and said, she said, Kaiser, you know, I said, listen, um, is it more likely that all these people got him completely wrong? Or is it more likely that the circumstances under which he entered office were so Unforeseen and so unforeseen. I mean, he came into office under near coup conditions. We that- just cannot forget what was happening. The year 2012, there was a, this was a, not a smooth leadership transition. This was one where that was heavily contested by people, like I said, you know, who had these deep entrenched interests, uh, where they, uh, where he really felt deeply personally insecure. You know, we have that mysterious period in September of 2012 where he disappeared for a couple of weeks. And there's all sorts of rumors as to, to what had happened. But what we do know is there was a, a genuine live challenge to his assumption of the leadership and that it came from Bo Xilai and Zhou Yun Kong and a clique within the highest echelons of, of the Chinese leadership. So if he's paranoid and, and, uh, and if he's, uh, Quite illiberal, I think that has to be included in as mm-hmm. part of the explanation. And her omitting that was just, I thought, really, really strange. Yeah, um, I, I, I wasn't even, uh, I wasn't even really aware of that. So, so he was kind of the anti-corruption candidate in a he sense. He was, yeah. And 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 has he delivered on that? Because you know, when you hear about, when I hear about a leader in a somewhat authoritarian country putting people in prison for corruption. I never know what's going on. Like in Saudi Arabia, I assume most of these guys are just threatening to, to the crown prince, right? And, and I never know what's going on, but has he, in your view, has he, uh, has he kind of delivered and been more or less, 
uh, upstanding in cracking down on corruption, or, is, or has there been a certain amount of political convenience in the, in the, the people who have been cracked down on? Yes, <laughs> to both. I mean, yes to both. Right. Uh, that, that's that's the simple answer, and I think it's one that most people who've studied the situation would 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 agree that yes, this was a political purge of a lot of people who were his enemies, and yes, a lot of people who were purged hadn't were not his enemies at all. They were just genuinely corrupt officials. I mean, mm-hmm. look, he's taken down, you know, uh, I think the last time I looked at the number, it was close to 200,000 officials, large and small. The, nobody has 200,000 enemies. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, it's just <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, I mean, it's, you know, by the way, one of these, uh, guys is, you know, Miles Guo. Is that the name Steve yeah, Bannon's Miles patron? Quaffer. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's an interesting case, which I guess brings us, uh, rapidly to the present. Um, Steve Bannon, of course, is just on a jihad to, uh, start, if not a cold war, maybe a hot war with China. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much you've been listening to him. I, I've become kind of, uh, mororbidly fascinated by his, his podcast. Yeah. It, yeah. It's so no, bizarre. I haven't listened to the podcast, but that's, I mean, he's an obsessive. But, but- yeah, no, he's an obsessive. He's, 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 uh, reignited. He's restarted the committee for the present danger. It's now focused on China. It's filled with, uh, people like Frank Gaffney. Yeah. And, um, and who, for those of you who don't know, and he's his, reliable, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 He's, I, 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 not my designated driver of choice, Frank Gaffney. The, the, um, so, uh, and just Miles, so my, anyway, Miles Guo, this uh, was extradited, I, I, he faces extradition, or right. the Chinese, he was indicted in China, he's now in the U.S., apparently funding Steve Bannon. Yes, he is, absolutely. Who is, who is openly in favor of regime change in China. That's right. Is bankrolled by a guy who would benefit from regime change in China because the current regime, regime has, uh, indicted him. Uh, do you know and, anything I mean, about who, that? Who's an absolute lunatic? I mean, <laughs> Guo and Gui, Miles Kwok is absolutely crazy. I, I, I love, all, yes, I, I interviewed Mike Forsyth and Alex Stevens, who are two New York Times supporters who are doing a lot of work on this guy. Uh, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to me. You know, they had actually, the day of the recording, had just come from his penthouse over the Sherry Netherlands, at the Sherry Netherlands Hotel uh, overlooking the park. Uh, and when, when they did the interview and they had some really wild stories about this guy, you know, how he was actually trying to enlist them in his scheme. You know, he, he openly was talking about, you know, what he could do to get them to, you know, work with him. Um, I have lots of stuff that I can't talk about because, but, but somebody in, in that organization just decided that they wanted to, that person has since left, but dished a ton of dirt, uh, that. Now this is which organization? The, the, well, the, the, both of them. So it's, look, I mean. The, 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 the Bannon Glow Nexus. Bannon Glow kind of- and, and Kyle Bass and all these other, these, these crazy people, um, on the lunatic fringe anti-Chinese right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Guo and Gui himself, I mean, he's, I, I don't know if you, if you've, if you've watched his videos, but, you know, no. he's, he's kind of a cult leader practically. You know, he does these daily weird rants, just, they're a mix of Alex Jones and Jim Jones. I mean, it's, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. I think um, he and Bannon have now formally established. Oh, yeah. Some kind of like nation state. They, I, I think like it's like <laughs> the real China or so. I mean, I think they've actually like filed papers or something. You know, it's like maybe comp. I, I don't know even where it exists physically. I, I maybe I'm misspeaking. I don't know. It just seems to get weirder and weirder. Yeah, that guy's just a. Well, he's a freak show. I mean, Bannon yeah. is just himself. Just yeah. I mean, it, I. I I just, I, I just wish he would be deplatformed. I, I just, I can't understand. Well, you know, it's strange. I mean, I, I, that uh, he says flat out crazy stuff. Uh, I, I mean, what's strange is the number of people who dignify the platform. Right. Like Mark Cuban appears on the same podcast where Steve Bannon says. I don't think he quite called for the execution of Bill Gates, but I mean, it was heading in that terror. It was right. saying things about what, uh, how traitorous, I don't know if he used that word, but, but that's the idea about Bill. He was saying the kinds of things that could lead a crazy listener to threaten Bill Gates' life. And, and, and then Mark Cuban, like fellow billionaire, um, is kind of dignifying the platform. And, and you know, and he's got, he's got, a, yeah. Bannon's got a legit admin, advertiser now. It's, uh, Oracle. 
the Jesus. the uh, Larry, uh, which is like Larry Ellison, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm not sure Larry himself would have made that that you know that. Well, who call, knows? Uh, so, well, anyway, so we've they're, gone. They're on- eating their own now. They're starting to eat their own. I don't know if you saw today. So Kyle Bass, you know, big investor, he just tweeted earlier today uh, accusing Mike Pillsbury of being a Chinese spy. Which is, now remind us who Mike Pillsbury is. Mike I only Pillsbury is the guy that the Trump administration regards as their, their, one of their top China experts. He's the author, oh. he's a former CIA guy. He's the author of a book called The Hundred Year Marathon, which posits that, you know, China has this, this like long held master plan for world domination and goes on to spell. This guy, now he's being, he's openly accusing him of being a spy for the Chinese Communist Party, uh, because on Fox today, he, uh, made comments to the effect that, that, uh, the Chinese allegations of U.S. interference and the national endowment for the democracy in Hong Kong, uh, are not entirely without merit. Mm. So, so basically just admitting what anyone can find out, you know, you can go on the NED site and, and search for what they funded in Hong Kong. Sure, of course, there's, it's a tiny amount of money. It's, you know, $1.4 million or something like that. But, you know, for him saying this, a, a pretty banal, Truth, he's now being accused by one of mm-hmm. his own of being a spy. I, I like seeing this. It's they'll, they'll they'll all eat each other. I mean, I'm sure Bannon and Guo will turn on one each other on one another one of these days too. Uh, I would buy tickets. Uh, um, me too. So I guess uh, I mean we should uh, we, we've gone on a while. Uh, yeah. <laughs> try Thank to you. try to. Uh, um, what should we say? I, I mean, can you give us any uh, any signs of? Uh, any signs of of hope? I mean, I mean, you know, Bannon's a fringe character, but but unfortunately, there are yeah. s- core political dynamics at work now, just having to do with the Biden versus Trump contest that seem to be driving this in a bad direction. Yeah, let me give you some some signs of hope. I mean, I yeah, I, I said earlier that I was worried about, and I think you've you've talked about too how the Biden campaign and some of the PACs that have been supporting it have, have made a couple of commercials that you know really kind of went after China. I'm, I'm just gonna opt, the optimist in me says that this is just political expediency. I think it's wrong-headed political expediency. It won't yield the results that they are hoping for. But I know a lot of the people now who are going to be, uh, in, uh, major positions when Biden wins in November, you know, inshallah. Yeah, I'm superstitious, so I would yeah, say yeah. So but, but, right. Yeah, I know, so I don't want to jinx that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these are people who are the like Jake Sullivan, uh, Ryan Haas, uh, who's not Brookings, but was, uh, you know, uh, the Obama administration national security. Um, Jeff Prescott, uh, who was on Middle East stuff, but is a China guy. Uh, they're all in the orbit and they are all really smart, really sensible, honorable people. Uh, and these are not people, I mean, these are people who, have a sense of the stakes and have skin in the game and, uh, for whom China is not just some distant abstraction, but it's, you know, real, real human beings. They've all worked or, or worked close to China in, in their past. And so I, I think I, I trust to that. Um, there are other people who, who may be close to the, you know, Biden land who I am not so fond of, but, um, they seem to be outnumbered by the good guys. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, things, uh, I would expect things to get somewhat better, uh, if Biden wins. Y- you never know. There's a lot of, no, a lot know. of dynamics at, at play. Um, so, but this has been, uh, uh, this has been illuminating for me. I hope for a lot of people. I, I want to give you one last chance to, uh, say anything you, if there are any like major misconceptions you think may be common in America, um, uh, or, or just something you wish people would understand about China. Yeah, um, I guess that there's we ha- one. Okay, I want to go after this idea that engagement was a failure. Mm-hmm. I mean, this this has become almost accepted as conventional wisdom. I think that it is a straw man version of what pro engagement people argued in the first place. Nobody mm-hmm. believed that engaging with China was going to yield a, you know, liberal multi-party democracy in China overnight. Nobody thought so. Uh, but we all did believe that it would move China, uh, in the direction of being more, again, you know, a litany of the, the good things we want, the, 
tolerant and open and participatory and deliberative. Uh, and it did that. That's what I want to say is that, is that anyone who knew the China of the eighties of the early years after Tiananmen, who like me, I mean, I, right. I love it, and who saw what it had become, uh, how much more individual freedom people had, how much more room for expression people had, how much more mobility there was, how much more dignity, uh, pe- people had, uh, there's just simply just the variety of the diet, the openness to, to ideas. There's just no question in my mind right. that engagement was an unmitigated success. I, and, and why we are so allergic to that word now, why even people on my side are right. so shy about talking about, uh, or defending engagement, it, it, it's a source of, of great frustration to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking as someone who made pro-engagement arguments, uh, let me, let me add a little of that. I mean, in, in my book, Non-Zero, again, this gets into the directionality of history kind of, I, I, I said that I thought that it would be hard, especially in the information age, especially in an age of like digital technology, microelectronics, for, um, a country to, to have the kind of prosperity that freer markets can bring without granting something more in the way of freedom of, uh, you know, political freedom, freedom of expression, and so on. Um, it, it's certainly true that uh, China has uh, realized a certain amount of prosperity and, and they haven't made uh, as much movement may, uh, toward democracy as maybe some of us would have liked. But I would just say a couple of things. Uh, again, as you said, anyone – I actually am old enough to remember the Cold War before there was a move toward markets in China. And A, we had no idea was, what was going on in China. B, the Chinese people had no idea what was going on out here. Right. Uh, C, uh, you may – you know, things like the Cultural Revolution happened and tons of people got killed. Uh, but um, the – the a couple of other things I'd say – and correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think there is – a certain kind of political pluralism in China, which is to say, when people uh, in China have something they want to protest about, like it's a, a local lake that's polluted or something, they have a way of expressing that, and the government is often responsive, right? Am I am I wrong about that? No, you're not wrong. I mean, within limits, absolutely. But I, I, I would certainly not ignore the limits to that. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, they're... Uh, there are other ways besides the ballot box for people's voices to be heard. Yes. I, I mean, do I prefer the ballot box? Yes, I, I prefer the ballot box. But uh, that does not mean that there is not a method of for transmission of, of you know, popular sentiment. In fact, I think the Chinese Communist Party is probably more on top of monitoring public sentiment, for better or for worse, than most other governments. I mean, this well, is a deeply technocratic Regime, yeah. right? And and I have to admit, I've been surprised by their ability to do that. I thought there was more in the way of kind of intrinsically decentralizing tendencies in uh, digital technology, and it would be harder to to uh, monitor things. At the same time, I would suggest that um, maybe the, uh, the 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 government's commitment to this monitoring of this intensity does, to some extent, reflect that. These are kind of dangerous technologies. In other words, they do, uh, uh, they recognize that, uh, that digital technologies can, um, can have a pluralizing effect. Absolutely. And so this is, this is what you've just said. I mean, this is, you've encapsulated the two narratives that have described the way that Americans have for, for over the last dozen years or so have thought about the relationship between technologies and authoritarian politics we used to think we used to really subscribe to that emancipatory narrative right um and for some reason you know we 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 really did believe that but you know we went through a lot you know we had uh the you know the revelations from snowden about prism we had the disappointments of the arab spring we had cambridge analytica the 2016 election and and we've come out of, on the other side of this looking at china and believing that Actually, technology is the handmaiden of authoritarianism, mm-hmm. and I mean, we, to, to go to either extreme is ridiculous. I mean, it's a, it's always been both. It's always yeah. been you know, it's always had emancipatory properties, and it's always had uh, 
repressive properties and uh, that we've – somehow just sort of in our narrative swung so wildly from one to the other is just it's just childish i think yeah in a certain sense the night is young uh in another sense it's not which is that i think there are a lot of kind of global problems that can only be solved if the if the world's two greatest powers are on the same page or at least cooperating so i hope we can work things out amen amen to that so thanks so much for taking the time again uh so the new the the podcast is called uh Seneca, S-I-N-I-C-A. I, I strongly recommend it. Great diversity of topics, all China related. Um, and then the, the, the organization that, that puts it out also has a newsletter, right? That's right. It's SupChina, S-U-P-C-H-I-N-A. Uh, and we have a fantastic newsletter. I, I mean, there's a free version that comes out weekly, but I, I recommend putting out a few bucks and, and subscribing to the, uh, the paid newsletter, which is, Really invaluable if you're somebody who's interested in China. It's okay. every day. Okay. And um, you, uh, on Twitter, you're at what? It's just my full name, at K-A-I-S-E-R-K-U-O. Okay. And I am at Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R on Twitter. Um, well, again, thanks. I hope, you know, I, I, we, uh, there are so many interesting things that uh, – we wound up talking about we we didn't spend much time on the most obvious thing to talk about, which is like the pandemic and and the effects of that and so on. So uh, I hope. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll we'll turn the tables. I'll have you on my show, and we'll. Uh, we'll hey, talk about I'm that. game. I, I, right. I mean, you know, uh, and even if you don't, I'll probably ask you to come back and talk about that. I'd I'd love to do your podcast. It's it's a it's a great podcast. Great. And and um, so uh, uh let's uh. Let, let's let's call it a day and promise to uh, continue the conversation. Fantastic. Thank you so okay. much, Bob. All right. Thank you.